Okay, hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, yeah. All right, good. Um, I just need to make a quick correction on my introduction. I'm not actually an emergency doctor. I'm actually a surgeon. Uh, my uh, bad. I, I, I study uh, postdoctoral training in surgery and anesthesia together, because if you're going to take care of critical illness, you have to know more than an emergency doctor does about it. So um, basically, I go around the world and I take care of people. That's my job. And I've been to seven countries so far, and I'm looking forward to adding a few more to that. I was asked to tell you something about trauma today, and trauma is pretty much the focus of my studies and my profession. And particularly, my PhD is in critical medicine, which is um, surgery, emergency, and intensive care of life-threatening illnesses. Uh, I will not read to you today my PhD dissertation. That is the most boring thing I've ever seen or heard anyone do in any type of conference. Um, does anyone have any questions before we get started? Uh, my name is Mike. Everyone can call me Mike. Everybody calls me Mike. Um, the only people that ever call me Dr. Smirtkar are people who want a note that says that they don't have to go to work. Um, so if no one's got any questions, how many people do you got there? It looks like three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen. About fifteen people. We got twenty-four, Doc. I think uh, you're missing the back row from uh, the camera's vantage point. All right. So uh, without further ado, we'll try to get this show on the road. So Trauma is a disease of young people. And most trauma is actually going to be pediatric in nature. So now that we have the opening slide, let me skip to the next one. Next one, come on. It was working, there we go. So what are kids? Everybody in medicine goes around chanting the dogma that basically says kids are not little adults. But it begs the question, if they are not adults, what exactly are they? And if you took a biology course, uh, let me see if I can get my pointer up here on screen, laser pointer, okay. Um, you learn the life cycle of insects and different insects have different levels in the life cycle. And humans also have a life cycle. We have five stages to our life cycle instead of four, as is in this picture here. But um, children are actually the equivalent of larva in insects. And when you say they're not little adults, you're not just talking about the size. Children's physiology works differently than adult physiology. And it works differently at different points in time in their life. For example, neonates um, really are like a maggot. They don't have functioning kidneys. They, there's so much about them that's different compared to even toddlers. And we try to stay in pediatrics after the neonatal uh, period, but I'll just tell you, trauma is the same in all ages. Critical illness is the same in molecular biology and biochemistry. So if you can treat critical illness in one population, you can actually treat critical illness in all populations. Um, there's just a couple of things that change between them, and they're mostly very practical things. So now that we know what kids are, let's talk about what trauma is. Um, in science, you know that generally it's proved by mathematics, and the proof to trauma being a physical force is this equation here on the board. Don't worry, the only test that shows up on are the tests that I give to doctors. So you're not gonna see that, you're not gonna be asked to calculate it. But you can read the definition here, you don't need me to read it to you. The most important thing I can say about this slide is the picture. Right now, it's early in the morning, it's the beginning of this lecture, and everybody is happy to learn about trauma. We'll see if it's the same by the end. But um, the other thing that I made mention of here is that trauma is a systemic disease. And that's true no matter how major or how minor the trauma. Every time you smash your finger in something, 
it changes the biomolecular function of your entire body, especially your brain. Now, of course, when you have a minor injury, it doesn't change that much for very long, and you probably won't even notice the effects. But in major in injury, it can change them not only for the duration of the injury, but also for the rest of your life. And we'll talk about that a little more later. Uh, here are some basic facts on trauma that I like to share with everybody that I give trauma lectures on. 95% uh, of all trauma is not life-threatening. That's what NLT on here stands for. It's mostly orthopedic trauma, which is mu muscular skeletal trauma. Um, the real life-threatening trauma, with one exception, is usually vascular. I'll tell you about the exception later. Trauma affects all age groups, and as people are getting older, we're seeing more and more geriatric trauma, which is very strange because historically, as you can see here, it's the number one cause of morbidity and mortality for 1 to 45, but it's gaining in mortality numbers in the geriatric population simply because modern medicine is keeping them alive longer. Uh, car crash is still the leading cause of death worldwide, even after COVID. Uh, women recover from trauma better because specifically of estrogen and progesterone. They are anti-apoptotic agents in your body, which means they stop your injured cells from killing themselves. There's actually been some studies that were published on injecting hormones into men who suffer from trauma more often. Um, but right now those are unconclusive. Um, not getting hurt is the best way to take care of getting hurt. The next thing that I have here, I think is the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. When we're taking care of trauma patients, in my opinion, it's the best type of medicine because you're basically returning people to school, to work, to life, to their family. It's not like cardiology where you got some 70 year old who had a heart attack and you're going to do a coronary bypass or you're going to stent them and they're going to go home and sit on their couch and watch television for the next 10 years of their life. Uh, the only medical discipline that saves more lives than trauma care is pediatric oncology because they have an 80 percent cure rate to their cancer, which is usually uh, leukemia. Psychological effects of trauma are lifelong, and many trauma centers will have psych support groups for victims of trauma as well as for providers. And tra the very last thing here is also something very important if you're going to work in EMS. Trauma is the disease of the poor, uneducated, and addicted. All of your patients are going to be one of these things if they're trauma patients. They're going to be intoxicated. They're going to have drugs in their system they're going to do stupid things and they're going to put themselves in positions that are unsafe whether it's unintentionally through working in jobs like construction and things where physical injury is very popular to uh, just making dumb decisions about what their capabilities are uh, there's also a joke in trauma worldwide, it's the two dudes. When you ask someone who shot you or stabbed you or beat you, it's always two dudes. And one thing that two dudes can't stand is someone minding their own business. Because <laughs> that that's the next qu question you ask, right? What happened? These two dudes beat me up. What were you doing? Oh, it was 2 a.m. and I was just taking my library books back in the worst neighborhood in town. What a coincidence. Okay, so um, when you're talking about trauma, a lot of times we have to talk about shock. And I'm going to teach you how to speak three languages today. So I didn't spell shock incorrectly. I spelled it in French because the first person to describe shock was Ledran. He was a French surgeon. And what he was actually describing was not hypotension. He was describing what exactly happens when a musket ball hits a human body, because that's when he lived and he was a war surgeon. And it comes down to three parts. It's the bleeding, the inflammation, and the caninogen system. And I will not make you memorize all of this, but 
uh, I'll try to keep it into facts that you can use. When you're evaluating someone for shock, a lot of times in especially basic education, whether it's EMS or medical school in the not the postdoctoral stage, they tell you that shock is basically some form of hypotension. So they'll say like sepsis is, you know, X problem. And once it gets hypotensive, now it's septic shock. And that's not entirely true. And it's a very oversimplified view of it. So I'm going to take you through the full view of it so you can understand exactly what you're dealing with. And whether you go on to be a paramedic or you go on to be a nurse or a physician, you will probably know more about shock at the end of this than most people do. Okay, so shock comes in two different forms, compensated and decompensated. And the reason I picked this marriage picture is because in all diseases, whether you're talking about shock and trauma or you're talking about autoimmune diseases, in the original time period in the disease, the body has this super compensation where it's doing better than it does even under normal conditions. And in medicine, we call that the honeymoon period. So anytime you hear, whether you're talking about trauma or cardiology or whatever, honeymoon period, it is the period of super compensation. And then, of course, we have decompensation, which is when the body can no longer keep up this uh, compensation of the disease. And we have a couple of colorful acronyms for it. I'm from the North. I'm a Yankee. So we call it CTD, which is circling the drain. I worked for a period in Louisiana where I learned FTD, which is fixing to die. You can oh, use whatever God. one that you like. So uh, what is shock? And the truth is, is that shock is not a disease. It's a time period in disease. And I teach this to all my pathophysiology students. This is the timeline of disease. You have health, whatever disease, compensation, decompensation, disseminated intervascular coagulation, multiple organ dysfunction, multiple organ failure, and of course, death. It doesn't matter if you're talking about trauma or about heart failure. So for example, in trauma, this goes very quickly. Usually you pick them up somewhere in decompensation. And once you get to this little arrow between mods and moth, medical care can no longer help them in modern times. So you're trying to deal with them between compensation and mods, because once they reach the late stage of mods, we just can't help them anymore. When you talk about a chronic disease like congestive heart failure, congestive heart failure is cardiogenic shock over decades. Patients go through the exact same formula it's just much longer. So that information should help you with the rest of your class. When you're talking about diseases and signs and symptoms, you will notice that eventually all signs and symptoms become shock. And all diseases start off with just a handful of signs and symptoms. Okay, I put this slide in here because I know that you guys are recording this and keeping this for all of posterity. I know instructors love this. This is students love this. They think if they memorize this that they're going to pass the test. The truth is you could spend hours and hours on this and they will ask you a question on your national registry exam that's not on here at all. Okay, so since the first part is bleeding, we're going to just do a quick recap on what bleeding is and what blood is. So in blood, you basically have 2.5 components. You have your formed elements, which are your blood cells, both red, white, and of course, platelets. And then you have the liquid part, which will come into effect later. You have transudate, which means that it's basically pure water. And you have exudate, which means that there's protein in it. All of you guys have seen this stuff, like for real in real life. Um, anytime you cut yourself, or, you know, you're messing with acne or something like that, and you start to see there might be some blood, there might be some pus, and then there's this like yellowish liquid and then eventually a clear liquid. This is exactly what we're talking about. It's very practical stuff. So when you take a first aid course, they tell you there is two types of bleeding, bleeding you can see and bleeding you can't see. And when you get into medicine, 
we try to make ourselves sound very important. So we say there's internal bleeding and external bleeding. But if you break the words down, what does it mean? Bleeding you can see and bleeding you can't. Um, on the left side here, this is obviously bleeding you can see. And this is one of our favorite techniques in surgery is to hook up suction to bleeding because we don't like blood everywhere. Uh, bacteria loves blood. Uh, particularly, it eats iron, which is found in every red blood cell. And so if you have blood around and you have bacteria, you will eventually have infection and sepsis. So we like to suction it. And the emergency department loves me when I come down. I take their wall suction off the wall and I suture someone with suction on because it doesn't spill a drop on their sheets or even their pillow. Uh, the other picture here, this is actually a picture of what we call a curling's ulcer. And in major trauma, because the histamine is used up in other activities other than creating mucus for your stomach, what happens in major trauma, people get ulcers in their stomach and duodenum. This is a picture of a duodenal ulcer right here, and it's called a curling's ulcer. And so if you have a major injury, you can expect that Nobody's going to give you ibuprofen because we're definitely worried about these curling's ulcers because they're inside the stomach. You don't notice them until they're very late. And from the EMS standpoint, it may show up as bleeding from the anus if it's really severe. Um, the other type of ulcer that's in the stomach is called the Cushing's ulcer. If you talked about head trauma, you know about Cushing's triad. Cushing also described the ulcer that is... Uh, formed post-traumatic brain injury. It works along the same lines as the uh, curling's ulcer. It's just a different part of the body that's doing it, but the outcome is the same. This is one of my favorite pictures in all of trauma because I know the doctor who took this picture. Uh, this is a self-inflicted gunshot wound with a shotgun in a suicide attempt. Um, just speaking quickly on the mechanism of injury of shotgun blasts, because the shotgun is a smooth bore rifle, it basically the pressure wave comes out before the projectile does. So what happens is when people are trying to suicide themselves, they put the shotgun underneath their chin, they pull the trigger, the pressure wave pushes their head back, and then the shot actually blasts off the lower part of their jaw. This is totally fixable. What will happen is they will shave a part of the tibia bone off into a nice little circle, and they'll reconstruct this person's face. They usually look better after the surgery than they did before they shot themselves. Plastics does a good job. All right, so when you first learn trauma, you learn things like there's DCAP BTLS, and you're looking at a mannequin or something or a classmate and you're trying to figure out like, okay, uh, what is the injury and where does it look? And this is just infinity, right? What could be wrong? Everything could be wrong. Anything could be wrong. Uh, one of the things that I tell my students in classroom is if you look at a patient and your first thought is that patient looks fucked up, you are totally right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody can see that. And if that's your first thought, then you know this is a real emergency. So I like to make things simple and have orderly lists. So there's only five places you can bleed to death in the world. And they're listed here. Um, we distinguish the peritoneal compartment from the retroperitoneal compartment in medicine. It's very important. The signs and symptoms are different. Um, in the long bone compartment, depending on whose book you read, emergency doctors like to say that you can lose up to a thousand milliliters of blood in the compartment of a long bone, and they're really talking about the femur. And if you buy the trauma book from the American College of Surgeons, it says 1500. Why? Because if it said the same thing, there wouldn't be two books, there'd only be one. So recognize that. If you're taking a registry exam, the answer is 1500 because it's written by emergency doctors. Or 1000, sorry. 1500 is the surgery book. Onto the ground is the most obvious. Can you bleed to death in your skull? 
The answer simply is no. There is not enough space in your skull to hemorrhage to death. However, what does happen is the blood pushes on your brain until it forces your brain out the foramen magnum, which is the hole that the spinal cord is in the, the bottom of your skull. So you thought there was going to be no point in anatomy and physiology. You're like, why do we have to learn these things? Because it matters. Um, and you get herniation. Have you guys been told that you're going to check pupillary reflexes to see if someone has a bad brain injury? With yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. So the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve number three, is the last or the second to last, sorry, my fault, second to last nerve to go. So when you are assessing for pupils, you're going to be looking at usually an unconscious person, somebody who looks bad, who you already answered the question, does this person look fucked up as yes? Uh, so don't think that you're going to be talking to somebody and you're going to assess pupils and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, your pupils are you know, wide and they're unreactive at eight millimeters. And so you must have a major brain injury. That's not how it works at all. Um, if you're checking pupillary response for reaction, you're checking for herniation, which is the brain coming out of the skull because of the blood in it. Um, the sec or the very last nerve to go is the um, auditory nerve which is why you never say bad things around unconscious people, especially if you're in an operating room, because their anesthesia might be deep enough that they don't have pupillary response, but they still can hear and understand. And if you've ever been unconscious, you know that you can hear and understand things and remember things. I've been unconscious. I can tell you everything that happened around me and what people were saying. Don't say bad things around unconscious people. Don't make jokes around unconscious people. They can hear you. The other thing that you have to remember with all central nervous system injury, which is brain and spinal cord, is liquid, liquefactive necrosis. And what that is, is central nervous tissue, when it dies, microglial cells, which are basically white blood cells in your CNS, come in Pac-Man, the injured nervous tissue. So it totally disintegrates all of the injured cells. And everybody thinks of cells like these little microscopic things. But if you took general chemistry, you understand what a mole is. You have moles worth of tissue and you lose moles worth of tissue. Um, the picture here is the difference between an epidural bleed and a subdural bleed. And to EMS, this is hugely important because an epidural bleed becomes fatal in about six hours. And when you're watching on TV, they're like, yeah, so-and-so had a skiing accident or a boating accident and they felt fine and they went home and six hours later they were dead. And that's specifically because of the epidural bleed. You can see the shape here. This comes from the middle meningeal artery, which is on the outside actually of your skull. It's very easy to break and it takes a long time before it can herniate. The subdural bleed is when the bridging veins in your skull are broken because there's veins that go from the outside of your skull to the inside. We call them bridging veins and a sharp movement will cause them to break. You'll get a slow bleed, which doesn't usually herniate. So generally, if they have an epidural bleed, it's an Im immediate emergency. If they have a subdural bleed, it may never become an emergency. All right, so speaking of bleeding, we have to talk about hemostasis, so you know what to do, right? Uh, you guys are EMT class, I understand? Correct. All right, super. I got great news for you. Direct pressure stops about 90% of all bleeding. And what direct pressure is simply is when the pressure of outside of the vessel is greater than the pressure inside of the vessel. And pressure wins, right? So outside pressure beats inside pressure. There's no bleeding. Tourniquets are very popular, especially after the second war in Iraq for major injuries and major bleeding. 
there used to be this idea that if you put a tourniquet on, the person was automatically going to lose the limb. That might have been true in the 1970s and early 80s. But now we got this thing called vascular surgery, and a tourniquet does not automatically mean loss of the limb anymore. I would say to you, if you look at the person and you think, should I put a tourniquet on this? The answer is yes. If you're considering should I, do it. Because you, if you're wrong, the outcome is the same. Nothing happens. If you don't put the tourniquet on and you're wrong, then the person might die. So always err on the side of caution. Wound packing has come back to EMS. In the early 70s and 80s, wound packing was something EMS did. And then somebody came out and said, stop putting things in wounds. And for about 15 or 20 years, people stopped putting things in wounds. And then they decided that, wait a minute, if you have axillary injuries or abdominal injuries, you can't put a tourniquet on that, right? There is no such thing as a neck tourniquet when someone's bleeding from the head. Uh, nobody laughed at that. Must be early in the morning. So uh, now we stuff things in wounds again. And in surgery, we use wound packing on every patient. It works really good. Uh, chemical adjuncts come in one of two varieties. One is a prepared uh, bandage. It's a chitin bandage because they're using chitin because it's exothermic. And you basically burn or cauterize the wound closed with it. From the surgery standpoint, it's a mess. I hate to see patients with chemical uh, bandages because it means it's going to be a really long day trying to clean up and fix all of that burn tissue. Um, one of the other things that we do is an improvised chemical adjunct, and we pour epinephrine all over our gauze bandages because epi is a vasoconstrictor, and when you put it on a bandage, it constricts the the end tissue that's bleeding, and it stops the bleeding for you. Electrocautery is a surgery thing, but you may see uh, handheld electrocautery things coming to an ambulance near you in the next 10 years. It's basically hot poker, the modern version of it. And of course, I tell surgical students, surgeons only have two skills. We can cut things and we can sew things. That's all we can do. So sutures, staples, dairy strips. That's how you sew things. And then, of course, in the most extreme conditions, you have to do an emergency amputation, which is there's so much diffuse bleeding from so many parts of a limb or an organ, like the spleen, that you just can't stop it before the patient bleeds to death. So the trick is, is you tie it off, which is a fancy way to say you put a tourniquet somewhere and you chop it off and then the situation is resolved. Um, obviously, nobody likes to have amputations. Uh, some historical things that have been taught in EMS specifically for bleeding is Trendelenburg position. The theory was that you would elevate the feet and all of the blood would rush into the heart, the brain and the kidneys. That was a great theory. It doesn't work because of the valves in your veins. The other thing is if it used to be the idea that you had to save the heart, the blood, and or the heart, the kidneys, and the brain, and the person would be okay, and that's not true. You can completely save those organs. The GI system and the liver will die, then the patient will ultimately die. You need more organs than three in your body. They used to teach pressure points in EMS class. Has anyone ever done this? No. no, it's the most impractical thing that's ever happened because it does work, right? You find an artery that's close to the surface of the skin and you press down on it, but you can't bandage it that way, which means you have to stand there and hold it or sit there and hold it. And who's going to do that? Nobody. And then once you get to the hospital, they're certainly not going to have a doctor or a nurse standing there holding a pressure point. It's madness. Um, elevation works for capillary bleeding. Uh, it doesn't work for arterial or venous bleeding at all. 
So if you're elevating things, it means you can just use direct pressure and you don't have to worry about it anymore. When you're using direct pressure and you put bandages on, be careful how tight you wrap them because the next part that we're going to talk about is inflammation and you can cause injury by wrapping something too tight. So this slide is going to be important to your life because it's on every test everywhere. It's the lethal trauma triad. And basically what happens is you are bleeding. In order to try and stop the bleeding, the capillary muscles, capillary sphincter muscles specifically in your arteries clamp down with all the energy they have. That uses a lot of energy. What happens when you run out of energy? You get uh, acidosis because you're switching from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. When you're talking about septic shock, when you're talking about hemorrhagic shock, the acidosis that you see is not from the end organ, it's from the capillary sphincter muscle. And the higher it is, not only does it mean the mortality is higher, what it's exactly telling you is these muscles are working as hard as they possibly can to try and stop this bleeding. Um, as the acidosis gets worse, the heart muscle performance gets worse because the acidosis affects the sodium potassium pump and it causes a less strong contraction, which of course causes hypothermia. The hypothermia stops blood coagulation because like any chemical reaction, you need chemicals moving quickly in order to react more often. When you're boiling water on the stove, you can see that. Um, the most important thing is as an EMT, keep your patients warm. Even if it's warm outside, even if you're sweating in the back of the ambulance, turn the heat on. It helps the patient. Uh, if you're about helping patients, stopping bleeding will help them a lot. Okay, I will take a breath here. And so now the second part of shock, I told you it's three parts, is inflammation. And the second language I'm going to teach you today is Greek. Uh, you can see at the bottom here in English, the words, and of course, in medicine, we use the Greek words. So if you are, you know, talking to normal people, use these words. If you're talking to doctors, use these words. Uh, and inflammation consists of just as it says. Everybody's had inflammation, whether it was a stuffy nose, whether it was from an injury, whether it was from just generally being sick with the flu or something. Um, it's always warm. It's always red. There's always swelling. Inflammation causes pain because specific chemicals of inflammation make your body more susceptible to pain. That's why you take NSAIDs like ibuprofen to get rid of pain because you're actually getting rid of the inflammation. And then of course, loss of function. And how this translates to EMS is, you're gonna get called for someone that fell, they broke a bone, you're gonna look at their arm or their leg or whatever you're looking at, and you're gonna say, wow, it looks really red and it's puffy and I can't feel if it's broken because they tell you, oh, you should check for crepitus, right? They say that to you. And then you touch this swollen area and suddenly the person's jumping out of the ceiling because it hurts so bad. And that's because the inflammation is increasing the amount of pain. It is what we call pain out of proportion, which means that the pain they're feeling is actually bigger than what you would think or observe that it would be. Is everybody with me? Yes. All right. We're still awake, we promise. Yes, okay. This is the boring part, I promise, but you have to know this stuff. All right, so then the third part of shock, as Ledran described it and is backed up by molecular biology today, is the caninogen system. And what you really need to know about caninogen is very simple. Substance P starts the process off. It causes the release of bradykinin, and histamine, which causes vasodilation. Obviously, if you're trying to stop bleeding, the blood vessel getting bigger makes it harder. Uh, there's an equation that I use every day. It's called Pusoli's equation. 
and basically what it states is that the radius of the blood vessel is to the fourth power uh, when it increases. So any increase is a huge increase and histamine and bradycaine mediate that. That's why when you see that inflammation and the redness and the swelling, that's all comes from bradykinin. Okay, so signs and symptoms of shock. Remember our honeymoon phase picture and our circling the drain picture? Uh, the honeymoon phase is an increased heart rate. Increased cardiac output means increased metabolites and oxygen to the cells. It means that there's the cells are working better than average. Cusmol's respirations. It's not just a technical term. When you see someone in this respiratory pattern, what you're seeing is respiratory compensation of acidosis. They're blowing off CO2 in order to lower the acidosis in their body. Uh, you see it in all critical illness, not just shock. And you can see it from the door. So like any of you guys got older grandparents or something? Yes, no. Yeah. You visit them, they're sleeping, you're staring at them like, are they breathing? <laughs> the same thing with Cosmos respirations. When you go to a patient, whether you're in the hospital, whether you're on an ambulance, as soon as you walk in the door, if they have a Cosmos respirations pattern, you'll see it from 20 feet away. And as soon as you see it, you know that patient's in compensated shock. Okay, increased BP because increased cardiac output, increased blood pressure, right? If you are dealing with heart monitors because you are working with paramedics or because one day you become a paramedic or a nurse or a doctor, um, they will talk about increased MAP. And the monitor will tell you what the MAP is. It calculates it for you now. It's very rare to see a heart monitor that doesn't calculate MAP. Uh, historically, you almost never see it. But when you're dealing with patients that you don't have a heart monitor, on yet or for yet, the pulse pressure, which is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure, is gonna be a strong indicator on how those patients are doing. And the wider it is, the better it is. When it starts to narrow, so the number gets smaller, um, that's when the patient starts the decompensatory phase and you know things are about to go bad on them. Uh, in kids, when things start to go bad, they continue to go bad and the child dies. It's very hard to get kids back from decompensated shock. Thirst is a big sign and symptom with this. Have any of you ever been in shock? No. No? no. no. You are wrong. The most mild form of shock is dehydration. And I know you have all been dehydrated at one point in your life or another. Okay. Remember when you were sick and you just felt horrible? Yeah. And your mom gave you like chicken soup? And you felt better? Yeah. The reason you felt better is because there's a crap load of salt in that soup. And she basically just gave you IV therapy through your mouth. <laughs> and solved the problem of your compensated shock. And that's why you started to feel better with mom's chicken soup. Uh, when I give it to patients, I'm not allowed to give them chicken soup. So what I do is I mix 50% Gatorade with 50% water in adults or 25% Gatorade and 75% water in kids. And I make them drink it. And when my daughter gets sick, she's like, can you give me the medicine? Absolutely, I can. <laughs> uh, when you work in austere medicine, which I do quite frequently, you quickly learn that you don't always have things like IV supplies. And if you do have them, you have to be sparing with them and only use them in an emergency. So oral fluid actually does work as good as IV fluid. But if your patient is decompensated, don't pour water down an unconscious person's mouth, please. And of course, hyper alertness. These are the people that when you get on scene after their car accident, after, you know, grandma fell down the stairs or broke her hip, they are hyper alert. 
they're looking around, they're taking everything in, they're not focused. You know, they have this flight of ideas thing going on. This is, this is early signs of shock. And like any disease, the earlier you intervene, the better the outcome. Uh, one of the things I study is subclinical detection of shock, which means finding it before you can see it. Um, late signs, these are the people that look fucked up. They have decreased heart rate, they're unconscious, they're breathing like twice a minute. You take their blood pressure, either you can't get it, because if you don't know on the automatic blood pressure cuff, it only goes down to about 60 before the machine can't read it anymore. That's 60 millimeters of mercury. Um, so then you have to take a manual blood pressure. The In all trauma centers around the world are manual blood pressure cuffs because just because a patient's blood pressure is 50 over 30 doesn't mean that they're going to die, but it does mean you have to know that it's 50 over 30. So don't discount the manual blood pressure cuff. Uh, this Going along with this is the decreased map, but again, the quick and dirty is the pulse pressure. And when you ha when you're resuscitating someone, whether it's in a trauma bay or an ambulance or on the street, you don't need map. All you have to know is, is the pulse pressure getting closer or farther apart? And if it's getting closer, things are going bad. If it's getting farther, things are getting better. Altered mental status is a big one. Please do not try to be the moral police. As I mentioned before, Addicted people have trauma all the time. It, they have multiple traumas. So you'll, they'll be your frequent flyers. An altered mental status is not only a sign of intoxication, it's a sign of shock. So if they're not acting right, treat them like they're sick. Don't treat them like they're drunk, because if you are wrong, you go to jail. And it's happened to paramedics in places like Washington, D.C., they get, you know, the guy, he's got altered mental status. They're like, oh, he's acting drunk. Yes, they act drunk. If any of you are planning careers in the military, I spent some time working at Kandahar Airfield for the Department of Defense. Anytime you have a person who's armed, you have to disarm them before you can treat them, especially anyone holding a grenade, because they might to start hallucinate. And if they think that they're defending themselves from you, there's going to be a problem. If you are in the United States where people like to carry guns, you have to disarm people who are in profound shock because they are a danger. And then, of course, the latest sign is cardiopulmonary arrest or what we call full arrest. This is your not breathing, no heartbeat arrest. It doesn't mean dead always, but many times it does. So do you need to take a break, have a breath? A lot of stuff to digest. Uh, I'll tell you, the next part has a lot more pictures because being a surgeon, I can't read, so I need a lot of pictures. <laughs> so do we want to take five or are we going to roll off? I'll put it to the group. Yeah, keep yeah I think we want to keep going, Doc. All right, so we'll keep going. So the different types of trauma or the different types of injuries. The basic version is the blunt trauma. And what you're looking at in the picture here is Cullen's sign. Remember when I told you there's only five places to bleed to death? When you see Cullen's sign, that means they're bleeding into their peritoneal cavity. Its counterpart is called Gray Turner's sign, and it is on the flanks by the kidneys, and that tells you they're bleeding in their retroperitoneal cavity. It means they need a surgery. But uh, the easiest way to remember it is you turn your body left and right. So the gray Turner sign is on the left and the right. The Cullen sign is what we call periumbilical ecchymosis, which means it's around the belly button. We, of course, then have penetrating trauma. It comes in two flavors, low velocity trauma and high velocity trauma. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But... The most important thing, if you see something sticking out of a patient, don't pull it out. That's my job. And it's not as simple as you think. Because if you ever get to go and observe a surgery, 
what you'll see is you'll cut the patient open. There will be bleeding. It looks like it's coming from everywhere, from nowhere. And you're spending a lot of time and a lot of blood trying to figure out where the bleeding is coming from. And so it's much easier to cut around this and stop the bleeding a little bit at a time than it is to pull this out and have blood coming from everywhere and try to figure out how you, and where the bleeding is to stop it. Burn is trauma. It meets the definition. It meets the mathematical formula that I showed you before. The treatment is the same. The pathophysiology is the same. One of the special injuries we deal with now is blast injuries. And these come in two flavors. Just like penetrating trauma, you have what we call low order explosive injuries, which is a push. Basically, there's an explosion. The explosion pushes things. You'll know it's a low order explosion because you might find amputated parts. If you see someone's hand, if you see someone's foot, that's a low order explosion. This picture here is from a low order explosion. It was a flashbang grenade thrown into a baby's crib somewhere in Georgia. I think it was Macon, Georgia. And it is the textbook low order explosive. You can see the burn around the face, but you can see that even on the nose here, which is obviously broken, you can still identify the tissue. You can still see what happened. And that is how you know it was a lower explosion. The high order explosion, you don't find parts. So they're going to be missing arms. They're going to be missing legs. They're going to be missing body parts. They have disintegrated. And what the actual difference is, is that the the atoms that make the, the tissue and hold it together are completely destroyed in a higher explosion. It's a molecular level event. And what it means practically is there's going to be bleeding from everywhere. And it's going to be very hard to control the bleeding. Uh, in addition to the blast injury from the tissue damage part, blast injuries have two components. The first component is the shock wave, which is blunt trauma, and the shrapnel, which is the penetrating trauma. So anytime you have a blast injury, you have both of these things. It's important to remember when you're assessing the patient that solid organs are more susceptible to blunt trauma than hollow organs. So your liver, uh, your reproductive organs, your heart, these have severe reaction to blunt trauma. The lungs is the exception of the hollow organs. The uh, Particularly, the lungs get a pneumothorax when they're susceptible to severe blunt trauma quickly. Um, that's what there is on types of injuries. And then, of course, you have the multi-system trauma patient. And this is my favorite game in the world. It's better than chess. It takes everything you know and all of your skills to win. And it's a life and death game. When you're dealing with different body systems, the treatments for different body systems are different, and some of them are in opposition. And the most important one to you is the opposition between the brain and the heart. All of the treatments that help the heart harm the brain. All of the treatments that harm the or that help the brain not only hurt the heart, they also cause bleeding. So if you have a patient who's bleeding to death with a head injury, this is the art of medicine. There's no formula for it. You have to come up with this balance. And you will end up doing the same thing as EMS providers. When you have this multi-system, terribly injured person, you're going to be playing this balancing game. How high can I get the blood pressure without increasing the bleeding? How, if I don't get the blood pressure high enough, they die of brain anoxia. If I get the blood pressure too high, they start hemorrhaging to death. Uh, if you like strategy games, this is the ultimate one. There's no better. One of my mentors was Dr. Ch Charles Yowler, and he is famous for saying that x-ray is the worst thing to ever happen to medicine. And the reason he believes this is because you only see two things on x-ray, air and bones. 
and dense tissue looks like bones, which leaves out blood vessels, which is the number one cause of life-threatening trauma. It leaves out muscles, and that's part of the 95% of trauma. It leaves out nerves. You can't see those things on x-ray. And how this applies to EMS, because EMS is not generally walking around looking at x-ray, is that you may be finding injuries and symptoms of injuries that never show up on an x-ray. And you have to tell whoever you're delivering the patient to about them. You know, the patient can't feel their, you know, fingers or they have a lot of swelling on their back kind of thing. It happens a lot. Uh, we call it death by radiology, where the patient comes into the emergency room, someone sends them to x-ray or CAT scan, and they die there because nobody bothered to look for the obvious injuries before relying on the radiology. If you ever work in a hospital, you will see this, where the patient dies in radiology. It, it's not every day, but it happens more than it ever should. Okay, so types of penetrating wounds. Incision is my favorite because it's the one that I do, right? I cut things. And the definition is important because an incised wound means that it's easy to put back together. You can expect bleeding. It's easy to see the bleeding. An excision, it means you cut something out. Hopefully in EMS, you never find people who cut things out because it's probably an important organ if they're cutting it out. Uh, we deal with stab injury. Stab has a specific definition in medicine and forensic pathology. It means a wound that's deeper than it is long. So anytime you tell someone a stab wound, what they're thinking is, is there's a wound that's very deep into the body that may not look very big, but can be just as if or more dangerous. And then, of course, your foreign body, which is the picture here, something is sticking out. Again, don't take things sticking out, out. If you have to cut it so that it's not a big, long lever, you know, like this long and it's wobbling and it's causing pain and bleeding, cut it down. Um, and then take a bunch of gauze and just wrap it and wrap it and wrap it until it stays in place. Um, that makes it better for everyone. And then, of course, your blunt wounds, which is laceration. A laceration is a tearing. It's different than an incision because it's caused by blunt force and it's not regular. You can have different types of lacerations. This is a simple one. The most complex are called stellate lacerations. They are, you know, going off in every direction. They're harder to sew, but not impossible. I'm sure you guys all have had an abrasion, but abrasions can be life-threatening. And the easiest example of that is road rash. Motorcycles. Motorcycles were built for trauma surgeons. I used to joke with people that when I finished medical school, I was going to open up a bar, a motorcycle shop, and a gun shop. <laughs> and that way I would never want for work. But road, road rash is an abrasion. Uh, it, when it's severe like that, it's treated like a burn. Contusion is a fancy way to say bruise. Remember, bleeding you can see and bleeding you can't see. Same thing with contusion. Contusion is a bruise. And disruption is the most severe. You very rarely see disruptions in EMS. You see them in surgery, and it's when the organs are physically pulled apart by the force, like you're breaking a piece of bread or anything you're tearing apart. Um, if you ever see a person who's in a car hit by a train because if the person is hit by a train, they just turn to dust. But if they're in a car or a truck and they get hit by a train, uh, they will look bad. They will be unresponsive. You'll go to the hospital. They will take x-rays in the emergency department. They will have all kinds of disruption. Uh, it's bad news. And then things that are both or either, the avulsion, Avulsion just means that basically it's hanging on by a thread. And you usually see it with skin and muscle. Bandage it. Moist bandage is okay. Dry bandage is okay. Um, as long as it's not an organ. If it's an intestine, wet is better. 
because if you just put dry gauze on it, it sticks to it, it pulls it apart, it causes damage when you try to fix it. Uh, amputation, that's an easy one too. Traumatic amputation is basically where you lose part of your body because of the force transferred to it, uh, gunshots, slashing injuries, explosions. These are all forms that cause traumatic amputation. The most common one actually is foot in the door where people are getting out of a car and the door gets closed on their foot and it partially amputates the foot, usually to a degree where it can't be reattached. And then you end up with a below the knee amputation because it's easier to fit the prosthetic. So if you get your foot chopped in a car door, chances are you're getting a below the knee amputation because they don't make prosthetics that fit to the ankle properly. And then of course, the last one is evisceration, which is what we got here where something that is inside is now outside, but desperately needs to be inside. At the EMS level, please do not push this stuff back in. It's not that simple. In the case of intestine, your intestine is rotated clockwise on the blood supply of your body. And if you rotate it counterclockwise, you will shut off the blood supply and you'll cause an ischemic gut. If somebody loses their entire intestine to ischemic gut, they die. That's it. Um, about 10% of patients have a condition called situs inversus, which is Latin for the opposite. And you have to be able to tell the difference and rotate it the right way when you put it in. Um, it includes any other eviscerated tissue, whether it's in their abdomen, um, Uterine prolapse is a type of evisceration. Don't push things back in. Anal prolapse is a type of evisceration. Don't push things back in. Uh, somebody who does that regularly has to do it. Okay, I told you that 95% of all traumatic injuries are orthopedic, and I meant it. And you talk a lot about, in EMS, open fractures. Probably, if I was estimating... 90% of all open fractures you're going to see are going to look like this. It's going to be just a small cut in the skin. It's going to look like it. This even looks like a hole. That's lucky. It usually just looks like a small laceration in the skin, about a centimeter in length. And once you have an open fracture, you need to have surgery because the internal body compartment has to be cleaned or it'll get infected, you'll get necrosis, you'll, it'll be bad. So the question is, how do you tell if the fracture is open or not? If you see any break in the skin, consider it an open fracture. And the reason it looks like this is because you, when you get injured, you have a muscle spasm. And what ends up happening is the bone comes out like you see in the second picture, but the muscles are still good, so they just spasm and pull it back in. And that's why it only looks like a little tiny hole. Um, if you see what you see on the right, which is the least common presentation by a lot, what's happening is not only is the bone broke, but so are all the muscles too. That's why they can't spasm it back in there. The solution is simple. You splint it. Always splint it. You Control pain. Uh, analgesia is the medical word for no pain. That's what it means, without pain. There's two more levels of it. Sedation means without pain and without uh, reaction. And then, of course, anesthesia is no pain, no reaction, no memory. And they escalate like a triangle. Rice is simple. Rest, ice, compress, and elevate because the elevation moves the transudate out of the area. It helps to reduce the swelling, which reduces the pain and takes away the chances of compartment syndrome, which we will talk about in a second. NSAIDs, these are your ibuprofen, uh, your Keterlac, not Tylenol. Tylenol is good for basically reducing fever and not much else. If it's really bad, you can use steroids. And then of course, like I said, if it's open or it's severe, you need to have surgery. Now that we've covered the popular ortho trauma, 
oops, sorry, let's get back to here. There is only one life-threatening orthopedic trauma injury. It's a flail chest. Flail chest comes in two versions. It comes in stable and unstable. You'll know it when you see it. In a stable flail, the person seems to be breathing normally. They seem to be compensating. This is an unstable flail chest, which is three or more ribs broken two or more places. They will not be breathing properly. You'll see their chest go like moving uh, opposite. We call it paradoxical movement. It's like a seesaw movement of the chest. The patient's lips will be blue. Their fingernail beds will be blue. They will not be oxygenating. You need to ventilate these people with a bag valve mask is going to be what you have or a CPAP, depending on what area of the country you have, because you have to basically use pressure, pneumatic pressure, to overcome the disruption and pressure in the chest cavity. A limb-threatening ortho injury is compartment syndrome. This usually happens when providers get really aggressive with their bandaging, and they circumferentially wrap the injured area which causes all of the swelling to shut down the uh, circulate the art the venous circulation which backs up the arterial circulation uh, the main sign is pain out of proportion these people will be screaming they they don't tolerate this well and having a pulse doesn't mean you don't have compartment syndrome you can get compartment syndrome with a change of 30 millimeters of mercury in blood pressure so, for example, right now, my blood pressure, I've had my coffee today, is probably about 130 over 80. And if I knock it down to 100 over 80, I'm still going to be sitting here talking to you like I have been the entire time. There will be no difference in what I look like. But if I have a circumferential bandage or something blocking my venous circulation, I will get compartment syndrome looking totally normal. Don't think that no pulse doesn't mean there's not compartment syndrome, very important. If you are the one that wrapped the leg or the arm or whatever you wrapped, even the center of the body can get compartment syndrome, the abdomen can get compartment syndrome, cut it off. Don't try to loosen it, don't play games. Cut it off, do it again. Okay. Very important to emergency people, whether you're a doctor, nurse, or in EMS, and it is the occult limb-threatening orthotrauma. Occult in medicine is the technical term for hidden. When you have a fall with an outstretched hand, which is this, it's called foosh, fall of outstretched hand, you can fracture your scaphoid. The complication of a scaphoid fracture, which is a bone in your wrist, is avascular necrosis, which means that the, the blood vessel is disrupted and the body dies because of lack of blood flow. You can lose your entire limb from a scaphoid fracture that's treated improperly. The treatment is to splint it, to go to the hospital where they will put on a orthoglass or a temporary splint. They will do their best job in the emergency room. Um, this is one of the few times an EMT or a paramedic working in the emergency room gets to play with plaster. It's a good time. I recommend it to all. But you do a good job because how you figure out if the scaphoid is fractured is about a week later you take an x-ray. And if the bone is healing, it was fractured. And if the bone is not healing, you can pull the splint off and not cast it because the bone was never fractured. But because of the limit of the technology of the x-ray machine, you can't see a scaphoid fracture on an x-ray, it's impossible. So you always treat a fall on an outstretched hand as if the scaphoid was fractured until that follow-up x-ray. If you have a patient who for whatever reason your ambulance is there, who fell on an outstretched hand, if they have pain in their arm or their wrist, splint their arm or their wrist. Okay, again, I don't like infinite possibilities. So when we are dealing with chest trauma, now that we talked about orthopedic trauma, we're going by body area, if you haven't noticed the pattern, there are 12 lethal tra traumatic injuries. They are affectionately known as the deadly dozen, right? Like the movie, deadly dozen. 
You care about six of them, the lethal six. You don't care about the other six unless you're a doctor. Whenever you find these, you treat it immediately. Airway obstruction. What's the most common airway obstruction they tell you in class? Tongue. What's the second most common? Teeth. Broken teeth. Okay. Tension pneumothorax. You guys know what a tension pneumo is compared to a regular pneumo? Now we just started trauma, Doc. Get, okay. uh, last, last class, go ahead and give us a little primer on that. Please. Okay. So pneumothorax means there's air in your chest on the outside of the lung. Just like with bleeding, what happens is when you have air on the outside pushing greater than the air on the inside, what ends up happening is you collapse the lung. A, a pneumothorax is a collapsed lung. That's the non-technical term. A tension pneumothorax means there's so much air in the chest that it's pushing the arch of the aorta and it's crimping it off like a hose. It's a life-threatening event because it's shutting off blood flow at the aorta. So no organ in the body is getting blood. Uh, it is an emergency and it has to be treated. And the easiest way to treat it is to let the air out because that converts a tension pneumothorax, which is life-threatening, to a pneumothorax, which is life-threatening, but not immediately, not in the next eight minutes. Um, when you're talking about decompressing a chest with a needle or a finger or a tube, and we could argue for hours over what EMS should be doing and is not doing and not come up with consensus, the reality is you have to let the air out. That's what you're, what's happening. And if you have a patient who looks fucked up, and I'm not, like, the purpose of vulgarity is to incite emotion. If you have a patient who looks really, really bad, and they have basically no blood pressure, treat them for a pneumo attention pneumothorax. If you're wrong, nothing happens. If you are right, you might save their life. Cardiac tamponade is basically you have a sack of tissue surrounding your heart called the pericardium. When blood gets in the pericardium, it is outside of the heart, inside of this sack, and it basically increases the pressure until it crushes the heart closed. There's not too much EMS can do about that. Um, there's not too much emergency doctors ever really do about that. Usually it's surgery either decompresses it with a needle, uh, which is sort of a misnomer because if you've ever tried to get blood through a needle, it's an impossible task. What ends up happening is you cut open their chest, you cut open the pericardium, you release the blood out of it, you stop whatever hole in the heart is causing it by sewing it, and that's how it's fixed. We call it a pericardial window in surgery. Uh, you'll see textbooks that tell you how to do it with a needle. If you can suck blood congealed blood that's been sitting around drying through a needle, you are a much better provider than I am. Um, open pneumothorax is the technical term for a sucking chest wound. And it's basically you have a hole big enough in your at, or thorax where it the air when you breathe is being sucked in through the hole, which is causing a pneumothorax and it subsequently a tension pneumothorax. You have to plug the hole. Uh, if you are working on an ambulance that has an Asherman chest seal, this is one of the greatest devices that's ever been invented because it's easy to use. One of the things that you might read about in your EMT textbook is called the non-occlusive dressing. And if you ever try to use one of these, let me tell you what a disaster it is. It comes in an aluminum package. You open the aluminum package, and it's basically a piece of gauze with Vaseline on it. And as soon as you get that on your gloves, because you're wearing gloves, right, because someone's bleeding, the, the gauze just crimps up into a little ball like a piece of cellophane. You can't get it undone. Now you've got blood and Vaseline on your gloves. You're just totally useless to the whole world. Go with Asherman chest seal. You peel off the sticky back and stick it on, and that's all there is to it. 
Uh, hopefully, Mr. PV will be able to get an Asherman chest seal if he hasn't already shown you one. It works much better than gauze covered in Vaseline. Massive hemothorax just means bleeding into the chest. And blood does not belong in the chest. It belongs in the vessels. And instead of air compressing the lungs and the heart, blood is compressing the lungs and the heart. This requires a tubal thoracotomy or chest tube. If you become an emergency doctor or a trauma surgeon, you will use a chest tube daily. And then, of course, flail chest we talked about earlier with orthopedic injuries. With this, you have to stabilize the chest. You can wrap it with a bandage. You can put saline bags on it. You can put sandbags, whatever you want to do. They don't recommend that anymore. They tell you just positive pressure ventilation. Positive pressure ventilation takes care of about 90%, but it's really painful. So when you stabilize the chest while you're positive pressure ventilation, you reduce the pain and you pick up that extra 10%. The other ones are long-term things. They happen after hours. So for example, an aortic disruption you would think is instantly fatal, but in fact, it's not. What happens in aortic disruption is you get a small tear in your aorta. The uh, ligamentum arteriosum, which holds the aorta in the chest, spasms because it's a muscle and it crimps this thing closed, this little hole closed. And even with a CAT scan, it takes about 24 hours before you can figure out there's an aortic disruption. And then you just take them to surgery, you put in one or two stitches, and the problem is solved. Uh, tracheal bronchial disruption, this is the same thing, only with the trachea and bronchial tree. Usually what happens is you find the tension pneumothorax, you treat the tension pneumothorax. After some hours to a day, it's not getting better. You do a... Uh, bronchoscope or use some barium for your CAT scan, you find a hole in the tracheal bronchial tree, you sew this up. Uh, myocardial contusion is a bruising of your heart. The, again, a hospital treatment, you're talking about ECMO and cardiac bypass and balloon pumps and stuff. This is, these things on the right side are not for EMS. Uh, traumatic, diaphragm, traumatic diaphragmatic tear, I have seen one of these in my whole life, it was detected after the patient was sent home. He came back with a um, hernia in his diaphragm with most of his guts into his chest. Um, there's no medical test for it. The only way you can diagnose a diaphragmatic tear is to cut the patient open and look at it. And we don't cut people open to look for diaphragmatic tears because it's a major exploratory operation for a very rare injury. Uh, esophageal disruption, it's a break in the esophagus. The food goes into your chest instead of going into your stomach. It causes infection. You die from sepsis. Pulmonary contusion is the exact same thing as myocardial contusion, only it's in the lungs instead of the heart. And those are the deadly 12 chest injuries. Six of them are your problem. All of them are my problem. <laughs> Okay, abdominal trauma. We could talk for hours on abdominal trauma. We're not going to talk for hours on abdominal trauma. The borders is the nipple to the inguinal crease, which is the crease between your leg and your pelvis. The reason the nipple is the uh, upper border, if you take a deep breath in, you can feel your diaphragm going up into your chest. And what do you think happens when people are driving a car and they see they're about to get into a car accident? They take a deep breath in, and now the border of the abdomen and the thorax has just changed. The same thing when people are about to get stabbed. They take a deep breath in, they get stabbed. When you see them, you think, oh, that's a stab wound in their uh, abdomen. In fact, it's in their chest. And now they're showing signs of a tension pneumothorax because they have air in their chest. So recognize the importance of the border being higher than what you would see anatomically. Uh, abdominal trauma includes the accessory digestive organs, that's the liver and the pancreas and the gallbladder. They can be penetrating trauma, they can be 
uh, blunt trauma. Usually, if you have trauma to the liver, you need an operation to insert a drain because bile will digest anything it touches, including yourself. Uh, obviously, trauma to the pancreas is hugely important. There is massive, massive bleeding with that because the pancreatic artery runs right down the center of the pancreas. Um, trauma to the stomach can be inside or outside, especially in kids. Kids swallow stuff. They swallow things with sharp edges. And what happens is, is they get trauma on the inside of the stomach that requires an operation to get it out. It's very rare that you see external forces cause stomach trauma. It happens, but that person will look so bad that you'll be like, oh, who knows what's wrong with you, everything. Um, small intestine is another place where you see uh, both inside and outside trauma. Trauma from swallowed things, trauma from the environment. Anytime you have a hole in your small or large intestine, you need an operation. Uh, that's the rule of thumb because all of literally the shit is going to leak into your abdomen. You're going to get septic and you're going to die. Um, I have seen one time where a surgeon didn't operate on a small intestine puncture and it didn't turn out bad. And Professor Bro, he is a legend in the trauma community. I would not try to do all the things he does. And for sure, I would operate on an intestinal puncture even when he wouldn't. Um, bladder injuries are problems because obviously you need to get rid of urine to protect your central nervous system in your body. And if your bladder is injured, you're going to have urinary retention. Something has to be done about that. Bladder injuries are also really hard to treat because they're bleeding inside the bladder. If you cut open to get to the bladder, you just cause more bleeding. You hope they stop. You usually spontaneously stop on their own. Uh, in the most severe instances, you have to operate. As EMS professionals, one of the most important things you will do, I will talk about later, is talk about what happened that the people at the hospital can't see. And if the patient, you know, was found with their bladder pressed against their steering wheel or they fell on a fence and hit exactly where the bladder was, you need to tell the hospital because there's no way for the hospital to know that until the patient starts decompensating if you don't tell them. Urogenital and fetal trauma. Usually, urogenital trauma is people sticking things in places they shouldn't be. I don't know about any of you, but I'm very lucky because many times I have been walking and I slipped and fell and nothing has gone up my anus. But I... <laughs> I see people on a weekly basis that have something in their anus and I ask them my favorite question to ask all patients. So how did that happen? <laughs> and the lies they come up with are amazing. They truly are. It's like a little child lying, right? You know, when a little kid lies to you, you're like, that's totally impossible. But they believe it. That's what adults do. Uh, if you have genital trauma, it's usually a sign of abuse. And in most states and in most countries, in fact, you have to report suspected abuse. We'll talk about abuse in another slide. I won't talk about it extensively here. Fetal trauma is trauma to a fetus in a pregnant woman, usually from a car accident. Um, depending on how good your neonatal intensive care is in your area, you can salvage these patients with emergency C-section as early as 17 weeks. Uh, the average is 19. Uh, you'll definitely know something's going on because you'll try to detect the fetal heartbeat. There will be a tachycardia or a bradycardia, fetal distress symptoms. And of course, you will transport this patient to the hospital. They may have bleeding from their urogenital tract. Um, if you find someone with trauma to the urogenital tract, listen, don't go rooting around in people's vaginas or people's anuses. You will get in trouble for that. You have to be a doctor to do stuff like that. Um, it's great being a doctor. You can do things that 
anywhere else in the world would be a crime, like stab people or cut people. <laughs> uh, pelvic injuries, you see pelvic fractures. The life-threatening part of a pelvic fracture is the vascular part because the fracture of the pelvis cuts the vasculature and the person is bleeding to death. So if you have a mechanism that's or some reason to suspect a pelvic fracture, definitely immobilize it. That's splinting, fancy way to say splinting, as best you can. There's three different types. They're pretty much self-explanatory. Anterior, posterior compression is when it breaks when you're pushing it front to back. Lateral is when it breaks by pushing it together. And vertical shear is when something cuts the wing of the pelvis. Uh, you can get these as part of the uh, traumatic birth, which we'll talk about momentarily. Oh, traumatic brain injury, very important. Sitting in EMS class does not cause traumatic brain injury. You're all been listening to me for about an hour and a half and you're like, speak for yourself. <laughs> but uh, traumatic brain injury involves all the things you see on the slide. ROS stands for reactive oxygen species. And basically, you injure the brain. And in addition to the direct trauma effect of the brain, there's some physiological changes which actually harm the brain more than it helps, but they're supposed to be compensatory. One of those changes is anytime your brain is injured, it starts making proteins which draw water into the cells. And if you remember from chapter one, there was, you know, you talked about hypotonic and hypertonic distribution of water. The cell basically sucks in water until it explodes, which causes more injury. And then of course the body's immune system attacks injured brain cells actively. So I'm not going to read you the slide. You've got a copy of this. You can read it anytime you want. Uh, do maintain a map of 90. Remember, I told you in multi-system trauma, you have to keep blood going to the brain. The, blood, the brain needs 25% of the minute volume of blood in your body. It needs sugar. It needs oxygen together. Um, if you have a traumatic brain injury, you'll have an increase in the intracranial pressure. And basically that's the body squeezing the brain through the foramen magnum, as I mentioned before in herniation. You're trying to prevent this by pumping fluid usually or blood into the brain. Uh, at the surgery level, a good surgeon is gonna cut a hemicraniectomy, which is a take a whole part of the skull off a bad surgeon is just going to try to put in a plug. The plug is not enough for such an injury. You may hear that hyperventilating re decreases intracranial pressure, and there is truth to that, but there's a caveat. It works for about three to five minutes. And so if you do it, it only works once. And the best time to do it is between the emergency room and the operating room. So if you're in an ambulance and you hyperventilate someone and you're like, look, they're getting better, in about five minutes, they're gonna be just as bad as they were before you did that. Um, for reasons beyond my explanation, many EMS systems still use normal saline and trauma. If you have influence in your system, please don't. Um, it causes many problems. The biggest problem it causes is it exacerbates these proteins in the brain that are drawing water in. The other problem it causes is reactive oxygen species, specifically means O2 minus, which is called a free radical in medicine. Anything a free radical touches, it kills. O2 minus is a bad free radical, but it's not as bad as hypochlorate. Hypochlorate is 3Cl minus. And when you set, when you drop salt into water, what happens? It dissolves completely, right? So it becomes Na and it becomes Cl. And Cl doesn't like to hang out alone. It, it's a very affectionate molecule and it likes menage a trois. So it finds two more of itself and hypochlorate you use to clean your sink, we call it bleach. 
and putting bleach into someone is always a bad idea. <laughs> Even for COVID. <laughs> <laughs> All right, spinal trauma, I'm going to make really easy for you. These are obligatory slides. There is a commandment somewhere that says when you talk about spinal trauma, you have to talk about these two slides. The one on the right is the dermatones. Understand this is only right 60% of the time, so you can have variation in this. Just because the patient has paralysis of the arms does not mean it started at T1. It could start anywhere from C5 to T4. Uh, recognize this is only 60%. When you're doing a physical exam, recognize this is only 60%. Then you have to talk about spinal pathways. Your spinal cord looks basically like an ethernet cable. It's a bunch of cables inside one big cable. If it's completely cut, you lost everything, but it's not always completely cut. It's usually partially cut, which means you lose some things, but not everything. Uh, the exception to this are blast and gunshot wounds. When a gunshot wound goes through this, it takes out everything. But if someone is stabbed, it may not even hit critical tissue, much less damage something. Um, and then you can memorize if you like. No one needs to know this. Even doctors don't need to memorize this unless you're probably a neurosurgeon. Where the parts of the various things in the spine are. And the reason you don't need to know it is because when you're operating on these people, you have a device that tells you when you come close to a functioning nerve and you can't reconnect nerves this small, though they try. Uh, anytime you have a spinal fracture or suspected spinal fracture, you could have potential spinal cord injury. You want to use soft splinting devices, your vacuum mattresses, your regular cot. We used to backboard all of these patients. I started as an EMT in 1989 to give you an idea of how far back I go. We backboarded everybody. 90-year-old lady with kyphosis, we would flatten her to that board and probably break her spine doing it. Please don't do that anymore. If you're working for a service that's still doing that, quit and go work somewhere respectable. You're not getting paid enough. Um, do not ever leave a patient on a backboard. In addition to causing pressure ulcers, which we call decubitus ulcers, it causes pain it causes compartment syndrome in the spine and it restricts breathing. So you spend all of this effort to make sure your patient is breathing only to make it worse by putting them on a backboard. Okay, secondary cord injury. We used to do things like this standing takedown because we thought if you moved a spinal fracture that you were gonna cause more damage. As the slide says, that is complete bullshit. Okay. Whoever tells you that doesn't know what they're talking about. The reality is when you have a spinal injury, all of these muscles and tendons next to the spine spasm and it's basically self splints. But because the spine is in a closed compartment, remember compartment syndrome in the leg? This is compartment syndrome in the spine. Obviously bad. It shuts down the anterior spinal artery, which supplies 80% of the blood to your spine. The posterior only supplies 20%. So if you have a problem with the posterior, you will not have an ischemic spinal injury. But if you have a problem with the anterior spinal artery because of these muscle spasms, because they are on a backboard, which is rigid and doesn't allow expansion, you will cause damage to the spine this way. And if this doesn't damage the spine, remember the microglial cells, the little Pac-Mans of the central nervous system? Central nervous system is brain and spine. So they're not only in the brain, they're also in the spine. And any damaged tissue that they find, they will eat. It's a chemical reaction. Like I make it sound human, like they're little Pac-Man, they eat things. It's a chemical reaction. It's not a consciousness. So if the spine is putting out the proper chemicals, the white blood cells will attack it. That is the cause of secondary spinal injury. <laughs>
Okay, are we back? Yeah, we're back for the most part. All right, super. We'll, we'll start with Burns and Deadpool. <laughs> Um, there's basically two types of burns. Burn is trauma. It fits the uh, mathematical definition of trauma. The first type of burn that you're looking on your left side of the screen is a thermal burn. It's pretty simple. You keep it cool and you cover it. Do not get infections. When you're talking about burns, there is a concept called the Jackson Circle of Burn, and you definitely need to understand it, if not for any other reason than to not look stupid in front of people you want to impress. Um, you basically have three types of burns now. It used to be four, but in medicine, when we don't have anything to do, we like to change the names of things. Um, so you will have a full thickness burn, which used to be called a third degree burn that goes all the way down to the bone and may include the bone. When you're counting percentage of burns, you count full thickness burn. Then you have your partial thickness burn, which used to be called second degree burn. And when you're counting burns, you count that part too. But on the periphery, you'll have the superficial burn or what used to be called first degree burn, and you don't count that. So if you're calling the hospital and you're giving a report with rule of nines, you're counting the full and partial thickness burns. You're not counting the superficial burns. Keep them cool, stop the burning, keep them covered. Uh, at the EMT level, we don't really have to talk about all of the treatment of burn and IV fluid and how much you give and when you give. And But I can tell you, if you're working with a medic who's using Parkland, Parkland burn formula seriously underestimates the fluid. You need easily double, sometimes triple. So be the EMT that saves the paramedic and be like, I don't think that's enough, boss. Um, the second type of burn here is a chemical burn. That's actually a retinoic acid burn. It comes from a prescription vitamin A cream that is used for acne. Uh, it is a chemical burn. The best explanation for chemical burns I ever got was from my hazardous materials instructor in the fire department, and he said exactly as you see it here, pollution or dilution is the solution to pollution. If it's wet, wash it off. If it's dry, dry it off, like wipe it away. But uh, if you're self-treating for acne, don't use too much vitamin A. It will burn you. Uh, hydrogen peroxide in high concentration will burn you. Uh, other chemical burns are usually industrial type of burns, and they're going to be much bigger in scale and much more severe. Uh, I could teach a class on all the different types of chemicals that will burn you and how badly. We don't have time for that. It would take days. Anytime you deal with burns, you're going to have to deal with one of these rules, either the rule of palms or the rule of nines. The good news is when you take your national registry exam, the only one you need to know is the middle row. Score. Right? Um, the neonates have their own rules. You just have to deal with it. What you definitely have to know, though, is what the critical burns are. And really, you can guess why. It doesn't take much explanation. You have burned eye, right? Life, limb, and eyesight. That's what trauma does. That's what we're here for. Because you could imagine how different your life would be if you couldn't see. Uh, mouth and nose can cause airway problems. Actual airway burns can cause airway problems. This is usually from swallowing something you shouldn't be swallowing, either hot food or some kind of chemical. Hands, joints, anus, and urogenital for obvious reasons, but also because when you're dealing with hands, you need your hands to live, and when you get scar tissue, it doesn't work. It's not flexible, so a burn on the hand will reduce your use of your hand for the rest of your life joints the same way. Um, for the anus and urogenital, you can actually swell these things shut and then get scar tissue on top of it, and now you no longer have a hole where you desperately need a hole. Uh, anytime any of these injuries exist, 
as a burn in any patient population, especially in kids, then you're you have to take them to a burn center because they're going to need very specialized and intensive treatment. Okay, page down. What happened to my where are we at? Okay, good news. This picture was taken by me in the second busiest trauma center in the United States of America at 2.42 a.m. in 2005. This man was shot three times. Uh, these two guys are paramedics. The rest of them are surgeons. Um, when you're assessing your trauma patient of every age, and there's some special stuff for kids, that's another slide. You must expose the trauma. If you don't know where the trauma is, you cut off everything. If it's a severe trauma, you cut off everything. You cannot allow for occult injuries, injuries you don't see, injuries that are not obvious. Okay, when you do this, make sure you lift up people's breasts, make sure you lift up their butt cheeks, open their butt cheeks, visualize everything. Uh, fat people, if they have, you know, a fundus or something, you have to lift that up, you have to check underneath because you can get people who are stabbed, even shot, where the fold of the body covers the injury. And then you have a patient that's dying and you don't know why. And obviously, if you don't know why, you can't do anything about it. Um, and if you have a patient who is a little altered and you can't see an injury, but they have an injury and they die on you, you're going to be in big trouble. Make sure you see everything. You correct bleeding, which here is circulation, airway and breathing problems as you find them. As soon as you find it, you fix it. You don't move on in your assessment until you fix that because the patient will be dead by the time you find, you're like, okay, I have assessed all the patient's injuries and now they're not bleeding and their blood is all over the ground. Don't try to assess blood loss, you can't. Uh, many scientific studies have tried to prove this. Working in surgery, the rule of thumb we use is you take what you think and you double it. Uh, and that even still leaves out a lot of it. Uh, it's completely inaccurate to try and visualize estimated blood loss. Uh, after you have corrected your life threats, you try to get a set of vital signs because that can tell you what direction you're going in. It can tell you if you're in the compensated or decompensated phase. Supportive care is all of your adjuncts. So the stuff that you do as the baseline. Basically, are they getting oxygen? Are they? Do they have an IV? Uh, do they have pain medications or whatever medications you need to give them? Uh, might be TXA. Who knows? Uh, this this is your baseline therapy. If you have it available to you, you should always provide pain relief. Not only is pain a symptom of disease, it also causes disease. When you're in pain, it causes a stress response. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. All of this takes energy. And in a patient who's already compensating and using extra energy, adding to that energy demand is not a good thing. Again, we are not the moral police. Drunk people, criminals, chronic pain uh, sufferers, all of these people really have pain. It's not for us to decide whether or not they sh deserve medication for it or not. That's not part of our job. Splinting also reduces a lot of pain. Don't underestimate splinting. Um, then you perform a secondary detailed exam is what I have here. The truth is I do all my exam at the same time because how I'm checking for bleeding, most patients have hair. And the only way you're going to find blood in hair at O oh, dark 30 on a street at a car accident is by touching it. So if you grab their skull with both hands and you feel something slippery on your gloves, it's probably blood. And you probably need to address that bleeding, especially in the scalp, which bleeds a lot. You can die from a scalp laceration. Uh, when I check their airway, I'm looking for broken teeth. I'm looking for fractured jaws. 
what we call malocclusion, where when the jaw is fractured bilaterally, there's no tongue control at all. So you have to do a jaw thrust to stop these people from basically dying from not having an airway. Like I said, broken teeth is the second most common cause of airway obstruction. If you've injured yourself bad enough that EMTs and paramedics are standing next to you trying to figure out what you did, you could have broken teeth. Uh, traumatic airway injuries where you've been hit in the trachea, all of these things are technically part of the secondary exam, but if you do the exam systemically and uh, quality early, this primary and secondary exam is all the same. Uh, one of the things I have here, be sure to check for cult injuries. I talked about that. Lift up fat folds, open butt cheeks, look. And then, of course, you monitor and reassess your patient as the situation determines. Uh, if they're life-threatening, they tell you every three to five minutes. Most, like, blood pressure machines and stuff are automatic now. It's just set to do it. Remember the manual blood pressure in the event that their blood pressure is too low for the machine to read it. Uh, just like a pilot, believe your instruments. If your instruments all show you're heading towards the ground and all you see is blue sky, you're heading towards the ground. Um, in focal injuries, someone broke their leg playing soccer. You don't have to cut off all their clothes. You don't have to reassess them every five minutes. Uh, you should always reassess after any intervention you take. Did it make it better or worse? Okay, simple rule. If you lose blood, you replace blood. If you lose water, you replace water. Way back in the beginning, we talked about the parts of blood and the parts of water. Uh, if you have a patient as an EMT who is shot with a gun or some other thing where you see major blood loss, you need to get them to the emergency room because the emergency room has blood. Uh, usually they do O negative until a type in screen, which is just faster than a type in match. Um, if you lose water, replace water. So if you have a patient with burns, you don't give those people blood. You give them uh, water and albumin, basically. You, you replace what they lose. Okay, pain assessment and control. Uh, everyone is familiar with the Wong Baker pain scale. If you're not yet familiar with it, you will be. Um, just by repetition of experience. Pain is subjective. So you ask someone, what's the pain? Zero to 10, they tell you 15. Great. You do something for them, you ask them again. What's the pain now? Did it make it better, did nothing, or made it worse? That's really what you need to know. Uh, you could use zero to 100. Try to avoid asking subjective questions like, is this the worst pain you have ever felt in your life? Man flu, right? You got a guy, he's sick, it looks like he's dying. He lays on the couch, it's terrible. Woman with the same exact illness, what she do when she's going to work, she's helping the kids, they're going to school, right? What's the worst pain you ever felt in your life? It, it's totally useless. Look for physical signs of pain. Is the person grimacing? Are they tense? Are they guarding? Which means they're trying to protect the injury site. These are ways of assessing pain. Uh, I kind of skip types of pain. There's four major types of pain, three that you generally deal with. Uh, acute pain is sometimes called nociceptive pain. It means there's a pain fiber, a pain nerve that's being triggered. Cold and pain are the same nerves. That's why when it's cold outside and you have a cavity in your tooth, it hurts. Um, same nerve. Then you have remembered pain. You see this a lot in kids, and we're talking about pediatric trauma. Anyone ever go to the doctor when you were little? Doctor did something like give you an injection. You remember that, don't you? <laughs> and it really hurts when you remember it. Any Hispanic people in the class? I can't see from here. One, two. Okay. When you have relatives who have pain, are they very vocal about it? <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> this is called remembered pain. It's a real thing. Um, in your frontal cortex, which is the part of the brain who, who you are, your personality and memories, you can remember pain. And then when you trigger that memory, it actually causes the pain sensation. And if you're trying to medicate these people as a paramedic or something, you have to give them benzodiazepines because the morphine or the fentanyl or the ketamine even is not working on the part of the brain where this pain is coming from. And that's why, especially in the hospital, we use what we call procedural sedation, which means we medicate people for procedures that hurt so they don't get remembered pain. And remembered pain can become chronic pain, uh, which creates its whole another issue. And then, of course, you have your uh, neuroleptic pain, which is when your nervous system heals improperly and you get crossover between nerves. Remember that nervous tract picture I showed you? The cable inside a cable? What happens is one of the nerves for, say, touch or motor nerve will cross over and heal to a pain nerve. And now every time you touch this area or you move this area, you actually trigger real pain. Uh, I touched a little bit about types of treatment. Splint pain, splinting things reduces pain. Um, if you have circumferential bandages and the patient's having pain, cut those bandages off. Um, whether you're using different types of medications, what type of medication for what pain I talked about briefly. Uh, I mentioned already it's a symptom and cause of disease. We talked about drug seekers and being the moral police. That's what you need to know about pain. We treat pain. Pain is subjective. The two most important things EMS can ever tell a doctor at the hospital. If you haven't seen this mechanism of injury video, watch it. It's hilarious. The link provided. Um, it's also very true. That's what makes it hilarious. Mechanism of injury means simply what happened. Because what happened decides what might be wrong. An index of suspicion is simply what might be wrong based on what happened. Some more progressive EMS agencies and especially AirMed like to take pictures. I love that. That helps a lot. The most important thing you can do as an EMS provider is see the conditions that the patient is in. Okay, I don't work in EMS anymore, but from my time, I know when people are living in bad conditions, if they're malnourished, if they are not having proper care for their medical problems, if they're living in dangerous conditions, uh, what those conditions are. Most doctors will never experience that in their lives. They come from a middle or upper class family. They work in the hospital. They live in a sterile environment. They don't know what happens and what goes wrong, but you do. In fact, in the United States, EMS is the last healthcare provider that will see a patient in their community. So how, what their community is plays a big role. People ask me all the time, what do you want to see on a patient report? Listen, I have pretty good eyesight. So when you roll in the door with a patient and you tell me his blood pressure, which is on your life back 15, I can see that at 20 feet. I don't need you to tell me. What I need to know is what I can't see. And, you know, you get these calls, patient is intubated. Yeah, I can see that. Right? That's obvious. Um, and what I can't see is what happened. And I can't see how your treatment changed the situation. That's what is critical information to pass on. Use the appropriate transport destination. The first picture is a real thing. We call it the Homeboy Ambulance Service. If you're not familiar with it, as I mentioned before, many trauma patients are criminals and they get hurt doing criminal stuff. And who's at the hospital? Doctors, nurses, and the police and cameras and they don't want to talk to the police and they don't want to be on camera so what they do is when the patient overdoses or was the victim of some kind of violence in a crime they drive up to the front of the hospital and they push the patient out the door of the moving car if they weren't injured they are now <laughs> 
one of the best EMS partners I ever had became a paramedic after being a drug user and getting pushed out of a car. She spent four weeks in the intensive care unit before she were, woke up. She's one of the best paramedics I know. Great to have on scene. What kind of drugs did you use? I used this. Oh, you look like this. You use this instead. Very cool partner to have. Uh, however, there are scientific studies that show that the homeboy ambulance service is better than an ambulance in severe trauma because the major help, the surgery, the blood, the auto transfusion, all of that stuff happens at the hospital. So the faster you get to the hospital after the onset of injury, the better these people do. Uh, there was a study in Philadelphia that actually showed that police throwing people in the back of their police car and driving to, to the hospital was more effective than an ALS ambulance. Again, save your paramedics. If you're working with a paramedic on an ambulance and that guy's starting IV, girl, doesn't matter, starting IVs, that kind of thing, remind them, like, we got to go. You're not helping. Uh, the other picture I have is the helicopter. Helicopters are both expensive and uh, rare resources. They're not always the best resource, especially in urban areas, because you could have driven the patient to the hospital five times in the car before you can get a helicopter even to your location. Wind, or sorry, wind, yeah. Weather dependent, availability dependent, landing zone dependent, that kind of thing. Um, for you guys who watch European TV, this is actually a TV show helicopter. I told you I, you'd learn how to speak three languages. This is your third, it's German. The show is Medicopter 117-117. Just because the pa patient is bad doesn't mean that your ambulance is less than a helicopter. Okay. Kid-specific trauma. Everything I have told you about trauma so far is good for kids and adults. So it's like the, you know, total trauma education. Going by age group and commonality. Neonatal trauma is the youngest and earliest age. The actual process of birth can cause trauma. Sometimes, uh, let's call them normal people, non-medical people, believe that the uterus actually nurtures the baby. It doesn't. The baby can attach to any organ, any tissue. What the uterus does is it kicks it out. That's what it's evolved for. And when it kicks it out, it can kick it out very violently. And even if you don't drop the baby, obviously that would be a trauma. We call that iatrogenic trauma, which means you did it. Um, the newborn baby can have traumatic injuries, particularly to the skull, if it's born completely normal vaginal delivery. You have to recognize this, especially if you wind up birthing a baby. <clears throat> and one of the easiest ways to see it is their head starts getting bigger and bigger because that's a hematoma. They have, they're bleeding in the skull. And we talked about why that's bad already. <clears throat> and of course, you always have two patients when you have a birth. You have a infant or more and the mother. And as you can see, these are traumatic injuries from the birthing process and they have to be fixed. And this is a normal delivery. This can happen. So when you have breech births or presenting limbs and things like that, it can get even crazier. The other thing that can happen that I want to mention specially, especially to warn you about this home birthing thing. One of the things that can happen is a rupture of the uterine artery during childbirth. It is a life-threatening event as soon as it happens. It's also very difficult to fix surgically. Because when you cut this person open, there's blood everywhere. And the uterine artery retracts after it's cut because it's under pressure normally. And finding it is very difficult, even for the best surgeons. And when women die in childbirth, this uterine artery rupture is usually the reason why. And that's why I go crazy when people are like, oh, yeah, I have the kid at home. Everything's OK. I sit in the bathtub. I'm like, if it goes well. But if it goes wrong, 
remember the best surgeons have trouble. So certainly if you're waiting for an ambulance going to the emergency room, what's happening and you're bleeding all this time, it looks bad for you. Uh, rupture of the uterine wall is extremely bad. And basically what happens, this happens a lot in young women having children, young being like 12, 13 years old, as well as women who had the old style of C-section. Um, about 15 years ago, we started changing how C-sections are done. And now a woman who has a C-section with a new technique can deliver normal vaginally. Under the old technique, they can't. What happens is the uterus contracts, and instead of the baby coming out of the birth canal, the wall of the uterus rips and the baby goes into the woman's abdomen. It's life-threatening for both the woman and the baby because as soon as the placenta separates in a few minutes, the baby is in the woman's abdomen with no way to breathe. It's a big problem. Don't birth things at home. Go to the hospital. Um, the next most common injury in the age group of basically neonate to two years old, one year old, two year old, depending on the development of the child is abuse. And there's statistics that show that children who are abused show up in the emergency system, whether it's EMS or emergency department, one time before they die. So you have to be aware of signs of abuse. Um, you have to report it in most places. It's a mandatory reporting incident. When you report it, don't be accusative because you could be wrong. And if you are wrong and you accuse someone of child abuse, your problems are just beginning. Who do you report it to? As EMS professionals, you're lucky. You can tell the doctor anything you want and it becomes the doctor's problem. <laughs> but uh, if you are a doctor, you must report it to the police. And it's never a good day when you're calling the police on patients. Because for some reason, cops can't do things tactfully. They walk in the room, they're like, so tell me again this story. And automatically the patient's having a stroke because they're like, oh my God, the police are here to arrest me. Uh, generally, if you haven't had children yet, or you haven't been around young children, until they get about two years old, they don't do much. They just lay there and cry and pee. And it's like very trilobite-like. And the... Uh, so they shouldn't have a lot of trauma. If you see a traumatic injury in someone less than two years old, start suspecting abuse. Again, don't accuse. Burns to these patients should never be. Usually if you see the burn though, it can be an accident because the bath water is too hot. Because when you put your hand in water, you feel a certain temperature. When you put a baby's body in water, that temperature has a different effect. So it may not be purposeful. Soft tissue injury, avulsions, lacerations, you should not see these things in this age group. Traumatic brain injury, you definitely shouldn't see. That's either a drop or a shaken baby syndrome kind of event. Broken bones is tricky. These kids should not have broken bones, but we'll talk about ones who naturally have broken bones. Uh, story is inconsistent with the injury. Again, my favorite question. So what happened? Tell me a story. And just generally from experience and especially experience working in EMS and seeing people in their homes, at their places of work, in the park, in the non-hospital environment, when you tell me some bullshit, I know immediately. Um, the child being withdrawn from the caregiver. Every child loves its mother. If it's If the child is trying to get away from its mother, that's a very strong sign of child abuse. Children don't like strangers. If the, str if the child prefers you to its mother or father, that is a very bad sign. And you definitely need to report that. And then urogenital injury. At different ages, kids explore their bodies. The first thing that they explore is what? Moms and dads. No moms and dads. Their mouth. They put things in their mouth. The second thing they explore is their butt. They start putting things in their butt. And then later at about 10 or 11 years old, maybe nine, depending, they discover their reproductive organs.
So if you have reproductive organ injury in somebody under the age of about eight years old, start thinking abuse. Some things that look like abuse but are not. The first one is osteogenesis imperfecta. It means your bones don't work properly and they spontaneously fracture. These kids will have fractures all over their body, multiple. They'll be in multiple stages of healing. These are what we call pathologic fractures. The bone just breaks. It, the kid could be laying there still with nothing interfering in a bubble and the bone will just break. Hemophilia, mostly in boys. You don't see a lot of hemophilia in girls because of the genetics of it. But if the kid is bleeding all the time or the, has you know, a history of transfusions and things like that, hemophilia is not abuse. Uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, this is like the circus performer's disease. They have skin tears and they break bones a lot. Uh, developmental disabilities, some kids are born with both genetic and traumatic injuries that cause developmental disease. Um, these kids generally will get hurt more and more often. It doesn't mean that they're being abused. It's just something that you have to be aware of is not abuse that could look like abuse. Nutritional disorders may not actually be abuse. The parents may not be withholding food, though that could be a form of abuse if you understand orthorexia, which is the um, disease of eating abnormally healthy. It's, it's so focused on health that it becomes pathologic. But the people may just be poor or they may not know how to properly feed a child or what to do. And that's not abuse, but it's an excellent chance for you to be a hero because you can teach these people something. Uh, various neoplastic, which means cancer and metabolic diseases can appear as signs of abuse, uh, especially kids get uh, osteocarcinoma. Adults do not get osteocarcinoma, which is a cancer of the bone. And as the cancer grows, the bone fractures uh, into like a million pieces. It's not necessarily an abuse. And this, I stole this word from my friend Kelly Grayson, parental monosynapticity. Uh, one of the ways he likes to insult people that I think is brilliant is he calls them monosynaptic, meaning they only have two brain cells with one connection. <laughs> and uh, he has another qualifier to that word, but we won't get into it because we don't need to. Uh, but most parents are new parents. They don't have experience with kids before, you know, some grew up with brothers and sisters they had to take care of. They want to do the best for their child, but they don't know how. And through this ignorance that is not purposeful, they hurt the child in various ways. That is not abuse. Stupidity is not abuse. Okay. Car accidents. I told you this is the number one killer of people worldwide, and it's still true and especially true for kids. This is an actual picture of the mechanism of how kids get hit by car. This kid died, as you would expect. Because their pelvis is their center of gravity and it's lower than the bumper, when kids get hit by a car, they go under the car and they get run over by it. Adults or adolescents, because your pelvis is higher than the bumper, when you get hit by the car, you go over it, you hit the windshield, you hit the roof, you hit the ground. Um, accidentally running people over with cars, especially kids, can happen to anybody. Because again, if you're parents, you understand. There's no kid, you turn your head, now there's kid. Or just the opposite. There's, n there's n a kid, you turn your head, now there's no kid. And you don't know where they went and you're searching. Um, if you find these people alive in the compensated phase, you have to be very aggressive at getting them to the hospital because the problems they have cannot be corrected by EMS and they're literally a ticking time bomb. Once they decompensate, they die. There's nothing anyone can do. Uh, the other uh, mechanism of car accident is kid versus car. And 
Fortunately, with modern safety things, there's less of this. But you have the issue of parents not putting kids in car seats properly, not using the proper car seats, and all the injuries that you can get with that based on your mechanism of injury and index of suspicion. This is crash test dummy of kid versus car. More kid versus car. If you ever see this, just please call the police because if the kid is ejected from the car, it's going to be a massive injury. If whatever lucky the kid actually remains in the car when the car suddenly stops and beats themselves all over the interior, that's going to be the best outcome of this situation. And it's extremely dangerous. And being a former fireman, I'm a very reactive person. I'm not about like, you need to be arrested and you need to be safe. I'm like, do whatever you want to do. You know my number when you're done, 911. Okay, when you have a problem, call me, I'll help you. What you did to get into that problem is not my business. But this is just negligently dangerous. I have the picture here of the kid flying through the car because they were unrestrained. This happens to adults too. In fact, um, in my younger years, one of my friends was riding in a back seat like this, and we were 20 years old. And he went right into the windshield because he, you know, you know, I'm from Ohio, and there's no back seat seatbelt law in Ohio, right? So you, they sit in between the seat, and the car suddenly stops, and the next thing you know, they they got a massive spinal injury from hitting the windshield, you know aviation safety glass. In your ambulance, you should have child restraints. There is no reason not to have a child restraint and that old idea of just have the mother sit on the cot and hold the baby, that's nonsense. When a car traveling approximately 25 miles an hour suddenly stops, the force that it's, um, that is being transferred to the people inside is in the tens of thousands of foot pounds per second. No human being is strong enough to hold another human being, child or not, securely in the event of a car accident, even at 25 miles an hour. So if you're going 35 or 45 or more, for sure you're not going to be able to do that. And because your job is to help patients, putting them in risk of their life by not being properly secured in your ambulance is not helping. In fact, it's the opposite of helping. Uh, diving injuries. Water injuries are the number three injury to children. The first is car accidents. The second is abuse. Water sports is number three. Uh, this is just a picture of all the ways you break yourself in diving injuries. Um, again, with small list instead of infinite knowledge or infinite possibilities, your C1 vertebrae called the atlas can only be fractured by compression. Compression. Your C2 vertebrae can only be fractured by extension. It's called a hangman's fracture. That's how hanging people kills them. Every other vertebrae in your body can only be injured by flexion, bending forward, or extension, bending backwards. So if you're trying to suspect a spinal injury, obviously the mechanism plays a strong role, especially in diving, because if you lose your top five vertebrae to a fracture, you're probably going to die. And when you realize that these people are injured underwater and they get a good mouthful of water now, their problems have just compounded because their emergency is more than just isolated trauma. No running and wear proper protective equipment. This second picture here is actually from a law firm that sued one of these, you know, water ski on the jet ski at the beach kind of people for not having proper safety equipment. It's very important, kids around water are properly supervised, proper safety equipment. Using your, you know, mechanism of injury, what's going to happen here? She's going to slip, she's going to fall, she's going to bust her head. Kids have bigger heads than the rest of their body. Head is the primary point of impact. Okay, she's going to do a half fall into the pool. 
hit something on the edge and then go into the water. Uh, angulated fractures are possible with this. It's all bad. And of course, the foosh, the fall with the outstretched hand. Um, very possible. In water sports, proper safety equipment. Sports injury is number four injury, uh, way kids are injured. I just love these pictures. I want to talk about two of them, three of them, technically. Number one, I don't know who lets kids on ATVs. Kids die on ATVs. Kids get seriously hurt on ATVs, especially in the southern United States. Kids are on these things, two or three of them on one. I don't get it. They are broken children, and they will always be serious when you find them. I know more girls that ride horses than guys, so this is the rare guy who's about to get a horse riding injury. The reason I picked the baseball player is because this creates a popular trauma called concomito cordis, which is when you get struck in the chest during the absolute refractory period of your heartbeat. And what happens is, is you get hit in the chest so hard, your heart goes into ventricular fibrillation. Obviously, it's not beating, and your heart not beating is a problem. Early defibrillation is the solution to this. If you get called to a sports field and there's an unconscious kid dying, AED should be your first order of treatment. And then this picture I love because this is a female soccer player. Soccer play soccer is much more popular in Europe than it is in the United States. And I'll just tell you this. I hate to see ma male soccer players because they are such babies. They barely <laughs> touch each other. They're laying on the ground crying. This girl's got a broken nose. She's like, well, I'm going back to coach or going back to play. Put me in, coach. I don't. Men's soccer, I don't know why people watch it. <laughs> okay, remember, trauma to the secondary cause. If you go to a car accident, it doesn't mean that the person has just stupid and crashed their car because they were texting on their phone or something. There could be an underlying medical issue. And whenever you're assessing a trauma patient, look for medical issues too because they may have crashed because they had a heart attack. They may have crashed because they have diabetes. Uh, here is a list of things that you should definitely look for that may cause a traumatic injury that are medical in nature. Um, I listed naturopathic medications because most of them don't do anything, but some of them are really dangerous. Um, hemlock is really dangerous. They use it for heart conditions, which is what it's for but uh, it's much better when it comes in a pill. We'll talk about iatrogenic in a minute, but people can have hypoxia for whatever reason. You know, they're in an area where it's low oxygen because they're painting model cars or putting together plastic models and the fumes from the glue displaces the oxygen and now they pass out and hurt themselves. Uh, malnutrition, you don't hear too much in the first world, but I work in austere medicine too, and I can tell you that malnutrition is a big issue still. And if you have immigrants and you're called to the home of an immigrant or the place of business where immigrants are working, malnutrition could be a real possibility. Alcohol and drugs intoxicates people. One of my friends wrote their PhD on adolescent alcoholism, and it is far more common than people give it credit for. Um, suicide. Suicide now is becoming one of the leading causes of death of preteen and teenage people. Uh, when we're talking about trauma, it's usually man, male or men, because the suicide method of choice for men are guns. The suicide choice for women are pills. And it has to do with because women don't like their body messed up when they're in you know, the funeral part. So as soon as there's the possibility of going to a call where suicide is involved, you have to start thinking, what is probably the cause? On There's many causes, and the psychologists are better at uh, lecturing on this than I am, but just the, the basic overview for the, pur the purpose of trauma. We talked about what the causes are. There is an increase in it. You have to be aware of the signs. The psychological studies on school shootings have shown that there is a new type of suicide called vengeance suicide. These people expect to die, but 
they're basically using the old military adage of, I'm going to die, but I'm taking as many of you with me as I can. And that's going to create your mass casualty trauma, obviously, and pediatric because it's a school. Um, could be medical trauma or both. So after the girl takes the pills, she may fall somewhere, cut herself, something to that. Suicide is part of trauma. Be aware of it. Understand the warning signs. Get people help. Prevention is the best thing. Um, in teenagers, since we're moving through by age, rape and sexual abuse is, I don't know if it's more common, but it's being reported more. It's very important to understand it could happen to any age and any gender, right? There's, I mean, not a week goes by you don't hear about priests raping young kids or young boys in Catholic church here. Maybe less prominent where you are, but it's big news here all the time. Sexual abuse is underreported. There are traumatic injuries involved. People can have sex until they injure themselves. Women run out of lubrication. They're stretching, tearing, that kind of thing. Men can actually fracture an erect penis. If it's angled too much, the actual erectile tissue fractures like a bone. It's close to cartilage is the best way I can describe it. It's not cartilage, but it's close molecularly. Uh, again, urogenital trauma of any kind suspect that there's some kind of abuse going on there. Clandestine abortions are going to really start popping up across the United States, especially after this latest Texas law. But traffic victims are often given back alley abortions because traffickers know as soon as someone goes to the hospital, the police are involved and they don't want the police involved. So they try to do a lot of things on their own. Um, and then when this fails or there's some kind of post-event complication, they're going to get homeboy ambulance service to the hospital because they don't want a murder investigation. Uh, environmental injuries, many traffic victims are kept in substandard conditions. I've seen them in shipping containers. I've seen them in abandoned mobile homes uh, with no heat, no light, no air conditioning, and they end up with not only uh, sexual trauma, but also environmental injuries from that. I have one time seen when I was working as a medic in Louisiana, a, tra a human trafficker tried to kill the girls when the police showed up by stuffing Oxycontin pills down their throats physically. And he was not successful in his murder attempt, but there was all kinds of airway and uh, esophageal trauma in addition to the overdose consideration. Uh, sexual abuse and trafficking is also recurrent. If you haven't heard, nobody snatches your kid from the grocery store. Most trafficked people are unknown, unliked. They're people who can disappear without anyone noticing. And as soon as they are rescued from a trafficking situation, they don't have any substantial help to go and get something to change, and they wind up back in the same situation that caused it the first time. Always report this. It's mandatory reporting most places. Again, if you're in EMS, you can just tell the doctor it becomes the doctor's problem. Um, as a doctor, I can tell you that I can expect to see two or three trafficking victims every three to six months. The number one cause of trafficking is sexual. The number two cause of trafficking is work. They're literally being worked as slaves in the modern world. And like I said, when they get injured, they'll wind up in your care. And you have to recognize not only their injury, but that they are also trafficked persons and being used as slaves. It can happen in low class places like factories. It can happen in high class places. Usually the, the high economic area slaves are usually domestic workers. Okay. And then that brings us to iatrogenic injuries. Iatrogenic is the medical term for medically induced injury. And it's usually a surgically injury. There's not too many medical injuries. There's medical problems or medical pathologies. 
but because more people are having outpatient surgeries, because hospitals are discharging people earlier, you may be called to a residence as an EMT or a paramedic, someone in EMS, to deal with a complication of surgery. Uh, thyroid surgery is outpatient. Many dental procedures are outpatient. Cosmetic medicine is always outpatient. So after they go and they get their messed up Botox injection, and now they can't breathe because you know their lips are so closed together that they can't get air through them. This is going to become your emergency medical problem. Post-discharge complications are going to be um, the most, I would say, problematic, where the patient had a major surgery, they go home to recuperate, and now there's a some type of long-term issue where the surgery fails. And a good example of this is after heart surgery. People who get the coronary bypass surgery, they go home after a few days and they're given this specific instruction. Do not lift anything more than eight pounds. Do not use a vacuum cleaner because the exertion will burst your coronary arteries. If you don't know how much eight pounds is, it's less than a gallon of water. Um, and then, of course, wounds. They Surgery causes wounds. They will have some kind of surgical incision that will get infected. It will uh, become disheased, which means it doesn't heal at all. And it will be an open wound. It is treated the same as trauma, even though it's more medical. The How it affects the body is the same pathology. Okay, so special considerations of assessing kids is age dependent. Um, young kids can't communicate. Old, when you reach about nine years old, you become very body conscious. You're worried about what your body looks like, so you don't like to expose it. You don't like to show people. You don't like people seeing it. When you get into the teenage years, you get very social conscious, right? Are you normal or like everyone else, or do you have special issues? These people in both of these age groups will actually try to conceal injuries and illness from you. Okay, don't allow this to be concealed. They will lie to you, they will hide things, they will make up crazy stories. And it they may not have even done anything wrong. They're just embarrassed by being injured, of bleeding when everyone else is not. Language is always an issue, especially in multicultural societies or here in Europe where there's 29 languages in roughly the state of Texas. Um, shame and embarrassment of parents, so especially adolescents will, who are still considered pediatrics, uh, will be ashamed to admit to things in front of their parents or they will be afraid of what their parents will say so they don't admit to things you have to isolate these people. You have to talk to them privately in the back of the ambulance. You have to do it tactfully. You can't tell the parents, you know, I need to talk to this person and you're messing up their medical care because they're going to start fighting back with you. It has to be non-confrontational. So you can say, look, you know, sometimes kids don't want to admit to things. I desperately need this information for their health. Can we speak in private? I've never met a parent who's like, no, right? Because you just press the button, you're like, important to their kids' health, need to speak in private. And as soon as you go with that, you'll get a lot of cooperation. Parental interference. Sometimes parents don't want to admit what their kids did. And so the parent is trying to guide the story, and the story has to do with mechanism of injury and index of suspicion, or they're trying to change the story in order to make put the kid in a better light. Be aware that these complicate your history and physical exam. Uh, special treatment considerations. Number one is rapid decompensation. In order to survive, you need energy in the form of ATP. The easiest way, or ATP production comes from two things, oxygen and metabolite, which is a nutrient, a protein, a starch, a sugar, something like that. Kids run out of the metabolite before they run out of oxygen. It's the exact opposite of adults. Adults run out of oxygen and may never run out of metabolite. So when a kid is, is compensating, 
they're burning through fuel. And the easiest thing to help that is to give them dextrose because that's readily usable fuel by the brain. Um, when a kid decompensates, it's usually because they ran out of this fuel and they can't create the energy to compensate anymore. Unfortunately, when these kids crash, as we call it, and go into cardiac arrest, they die because it's impossible to get this energy system started again with modern medicine. Uh, I was told by a very excellent pediatric intensivist one time in the hospital, if a kid goes into cardiac arrest, it's only because of negligence. There's no excuse for it in the hospital. Um, kids, as I mentioned in the assessment part of it, they don't want to cooperate with your assessment, either because they fear pain or they fear that they're somehow going to be different. You need to explain things to them in human language. Don't use medical terminology. Ask their permission. That goes a long way. They don't really have authority to give you permission, but it helps. And then, of course, distraction. The, uh, you know, look away. One of the things that I think is great for distracting kids, I buy the little glow sticks for Halloween. You can get them at any, you know, firefighting equipment shop. You break, you crack this thing, you give the glowing magic thing to the kid, and they're so focused on it, you can do whatever you want. Assessment, procedures, it works good. Parents should never be involved in any physical procedure with a child. They don't help hold them down, especially they don't do that. They don't poke them with anything. They do, they do nothing that causes pain and harm because if they're involved, the child will remember that as the parents hurting them. And the parents should always be the child's safe space. Remember, parents never help with procedures. Having said that, parents during resuscitation and care. They should be there for that. They should be able to witness resuscitation attempts. They should be willing and able to observe any procedure or care that's possible. Um, it may sometimes be limited by the environment, by the space in the ambulance, by what you need to do, that kind of thing. But if it's possible, they should be allowed. Never have them help. Uh, legal issues, this usually comes in the form of the parent has some religious um, belief. You have to know the laws of your state. In states and countries set their own laws, but in Ohio, where I'm from, Poland, where I'm currently at, and in Britain, where I, current, where I worked at one point, parents do not have the legal authority to stop life-saving treatment of any kind for any reason. You have to know the law of where you work because if the patient, if the family says we have a religious objection to that and you're in a state that says that doesn't mean anything to us, you must treat that child medically appropriately, irregardless of the parents. And then special equipment and comfort. Kids require special equipment. They're smaller, their anatomy is different. The things that you want to see are different. So you have to have this equipment. You can't just chop a eight millimeter ET tube down to you know two or three inches and call that pediatric. It's not. Uh, you have to have special equipment. And if you're, it, pediatric equipment and pediatric emergencies are like any other skill you use. If you do it a lot, you're comfortable with it. It's a normal thing for you. If you're not doing it a lot, it's the most terrifying thing in the world. And the only way you get comfortable is to do it a lot. And so even if you don't have a lot of patience, you should have a lot of training, hands-on training with your equipment regularly, even after school. Because like I said, if you're using it on real patients, you're getting the practice. But if you're not using it on patients, you're not touching it and you need to touch it. You need to be familiar with it. Uh, some kids will die. Regardless of what we do, they may be dead before we get there. Uh, one of the things that comes up in EMS a lot is wounds inconsistent with life. These are usually fairly obvious, a decapitation or the body has been dead for you know, hours and hours. It has rigor mortis or is post-rigor mortis, post-dependent post lividity. Um, 
there is no benefit to trying to resuscitate dead people, especially dead children. It's traumatic for the parents. It costs a lot of money uh, that the parents may have to pay even after the death of their child. Confirming death is important. You don't mark one eyeball and say someone's dead. You have to have objective findings, especially on a kid. You have to listen for heart tones. You have to listen for breath sounds. You have to hook them up to EKGs. You have to have objective, quantifiable evidence of death. Um, presenting the body, you may think you'll never have to do this. And unfortunately, I discovered only too late in EMS that I did have to do it. Sometimes you will have an instance where the patient is dead before you get there, especially a child. There may be vomit, there may be feces, there may be blood. Unfortunately, when I saw it, there was even semen. If you can, to the best of your abilities, help the patient or help the parents remember their child in the best light possible. Clean them up. You can say it's not your job, but you know, okay, it's not your job in EMS, but it's your job as a human. Be human, be compassionate. When you ask any healthcare provider, why did you get into this job? They say, I want to help people. Help people isn't defibrillation and surgeries and things like that all the time. It's a small part. After dealing with the death of a child, you're going to have to care for the parents. They are going to be upset. They may be physically violent because of their emotions and anger. Um, be aware of this. Be prepared for this. They may injure themselves, punching walls and all kinds of other stupid things. And then finally, we have Lazarus syndrome. If you haven't heard of this, this is when a quantifiably dead person comes back to life. And it happens rarely, but basically what happens is the person dies. They have all the signs of being dead, but during the period that their body is laying there, it's in such a low metabolic state, it can reset its metabolism and actually come back to life. It's a very rare phenomenon, but recognize that it exists. And especially in EMS, in Ohio, an EMS provider or a policeman has to sit with the body until the coroner or whoever to collect the body shows up. So for us, it was never a problem. But in some states and some countries, it's not required. And if you leave someone on scene who is verifiably dead and they come back to life, the media coverage of that is going to be horrible. And you're going to need a lawyer, too. Uh, on to something happier, provider mental health. Providers suffer from mental trauma. And especially in traumatic injuries of kids because major traumatic injuries, you're talking about brain damage, death, permanent disability. You're watching the suffering. It has effects on people. You talk about positive and co negative coping mechanisms. When I first started on my first day, we had a five fatality pediatric car accident. Four of the victims were 16 years old. One of them was 15 and all five of them were dead before we got there. I was told the next day by the people that I looked up to and became great mentors of mine, whatever you do, come back to work because it's like a boyfriend. The next one gets you over the last one. And I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't understand it at the time, but many years later, I learned that working through your problems is a positive coping mechanism. In fact, it's the only positive coping mechanism. And without the science, without the knowledge, but just from their experience of having been firemen and paramedics for many, many years, they were right. Go back to work. The, the next one is the one you're focused on, not the last one. And I've had about 32 years of focusing on the next one. From the bottom of my heart, it works. Negative coping mechanisms. These are the ones that work the best if you're not using the positive one. These are your alcohol, your drugs, your hypersexuality, I'm not going to tell you not to do these things because that's not realistic. But I will tell you, if you are doing these things, you need to get help before it gets worse because it's not going to get better doing these things, even if short term it seems to be helping you. <laughs>
um, even the best providers are affected by pediatric trauma. People who have been in my position where you've been doing it for 30 years or 20 years or 40 years, they start to project and they start to see their own kid as the patient when it happens. They start to imagine if it, what could happen to their kid. These are signs that you need help and there's no shame in it. Uh, many years ago came out a, con a concept called critical incident stress management. It has been totally debunked. It's been found to be more harmful than helping. But one of the good things that came out of it was called the peer debriefing, where the people on the call talk about the call, but are not forced to talk about it. It's basically a form of peer support. And peer support is going to be one of your best coping mechanisms. Nobody can make it in this world alone, no matter what political tribalism argument you've heard. You need other people. People who have no reason to help you, your friends, your coworkers. You will need these people. Um, if you're having problems, it affects your family and friends. All of your depression, anxiety, that kind of thing, it's going to take a toll on your family and your friends. If you're estranging your family, if you're losing friends, that's a sign you need help. So if you need help, get help. Uh, I got special permission from the artist to use this, so kudos to the artist. Thanks for everything. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> That's a real tombstone from my hometown. Uh, can I ask like, just about, I guess, your career? Uh, yeah, it was. my career has been the same the entire time. I started off as a cadet in the fire service and where I was living at the fire the EMS was part of the fire service and I was in a high school program where I basically got high school credit to work at the fire department and by the time I was a senior in high school I was working 70 hours a week at a fire department and I was going on all the calls and doing all the things that firemen and EMS people do um, as I was doing this more and more and <clears throat> enjoying it more and more, it seemed that I had a some kind of talent for medicine. And I was encouraged then to become a paramedic, which I did. I worked as a fire service paramedic and as a third service paramedic before taking a job in the hospital so that I could basically have the benefits and schedule so I could go to university, so I could finish my undergrad in order to apply to medical school. I went to medical school in Europe because my family's from Europe and there was a big family dynamic there that led to that determination. And I have been working as a physician, as a surgeon and anesthesiologist since graduating medical school. I worked uh, my first job after medical school. I was the director of operations for the civilian hospital at Kandahar Airfield, Afghanistan, not because of I would say medical knowledge, which was pretty good having come through the EMS system, but because a lot of the leadership lessons I learned working in fire and EMS was part of what needed to be done. Um, I've worked in seven countries in some of the busiest trauma centers in the world. I started as a medic at Metro Health Medical Center in Cleveland, which was the second busiest in the US at the time. I've worked for Royal London Hospital, which is the busiest in the EU. Uh, I love critically injured people and I like to help them. Thanks. And I'll, I'll give you a, while I got this picture up on the screen, my last name is Slovak and it translates to English directly as the angel of death. Nice. That's what my name means. <laughs> All right, thank you. Have a good one. You too, Bye. Thanks.